Okay, um, this is a very general introduction about land use. Obviously, quite a few of you in here, specifically the people that are participating in the um, session actively, already have that concept uh, in mind. Uh, but I think that a lot of people in archaeology are still a little bit kind of a, and trying to focus on what land use means. Actual land use is very easy. Actual land use, we see in here example for the city of Barcelona, for the entire Australia, or for Singapore. Actual land use is what kind of allocation use is given to a specific area of land. And uh, in cities that can go from, you know, being construction, airport, industrial, and in bigger area it could be, you know, grazing, cultivation of different type, extraction industry, and so on. But land use is not something that has happened in the last 100 or 200 years. Land use is something that happened fundamentally since human groups start inhabiting and using what goes around them. Um, we have hunting and gathering groups that are fundamentally started to modify their environment in some way, um, for instance, to support the growth of species that would be interesting because they attract animals or support the growth of species that are interested in relation to their fruits or wood or leaves and so on. So obviously the major change in land use happened fundamentally with the full-scale agriculture. And that is when we start seeing the transformation of uh, the vegetation and the origination of the current anthropogenic biomes that we have and we see all around us uh, today. So this is an important process that happened everywhere. But there is at the moment a problem in terms of how the land use is incorporated into what are the dynamic vegetation model. And dynamic vegetation models are models that are interesting and important to understanding the uh, land cover evolution beyond the land use, okay? To understand how the uh, cover of our planet has changed over time. And indeed, part of it is also related to human-induced uh, land cover. Um, all these various models at different level, from landscape model, ecosystem scale model, global models, and earth system model, they all incorporate models related on how vegetation has changed. And at the moment, they incorporate it mostly related to how vegetation has changed to in response to a climate change. But there is not much incorporated in relation to how vegetation has changed in response to um, human-induced change. And also, there is a problem of integrating the various scales. This is a little bit beyond the archaeological side, but it's still important because also, I think, in, for archaeology, it's important to look not only at the local or, um, let's say, um, continental level, but also at global level. An example of what means of having models and simulations related to the anthropogenic land cover change, we have here an example of three ways that illustrate changes in the uh, vegetation cover at two times 6k and 0.2k using three different ways of modeling that vegetation. One is the hive that take into consideration, at least partially, some human activity. The other one is the KK10 that is a model that takes actually uh, quite an important step to introduce the human activity and also in terms of, for instance, technologies and so on. And with yields, which is based only on pollen data, okay? And what we can see is that 
Okay, the, compa the direct comparison is not really possible because obviously being different models, it's not that we can say, okay, this come out in this way or in that way. But still, we can see that the interpretation coming out from the various models is, qu is quite different. And so this is already flashing out uh, the problem. And obviously, what makes that difference is how the human input is inserted in this model. Another example of this is written the reconstruction of the vegetation cover of most of Europe for AD 800. I mean, this is not a date very far back in time, so it's a date in which we also have already documents, okay? And, and so, in a sense, should be easier to gather all that information to have a proper reconstruction of the anthropogenic land cover change, but again, four different approaches, four different land covers. And this is a problem. It's not a problem only because it's telling us something different for a specific time in the past, but it's also a problem because this is a way to train the model for using predictive model. And if the training is wrong, or if the training is not correct, uh, then there is a problem for the prediction. So, in the light of this, um, the land cover 6K. The land cover 6K is a work group of pages, past global changes, um, that is basically dedicated to reconstructing all thing land cover and land use across the globe. So it's a, it's a global initiative, and um, it is basically separated in two lines, okay? Um, the part that interests us more is obviously the land use, um, because beyond the fact of the model that I showed you before, I mean, the land use change also influences many parameters, many variables that are in the model that we use. Hydrology, vegetation, microclimate, and so as a consequence, is acting on the regional and global climate. And so that's where the most interest is arising, at least for the wider community. Okay, um, the the goals of the working group: correct and constrain the land cover models, the anthropogenic land cover models. Okay, so that's contributing to models global models beyond what we have. Um, aggregate and synthesize vegetation and land use data. The first part, the pollen side, has been done already for a few years and is quite well advanced. Uh, where we need to push the work is from the land use side, for the human side. Um, and the next step would be to link the land use at the moment, the two lines are working in parallel, and then ideally, at a certain point, the two get together. Um, so the approach is database reconstruction, and as I was saying, the two are running on separate sides, both in terms of databases, but also in terms of construction of models, and then eventually, when they will be linked. So I was saying, land cover. Land cover is based on pollen data, so there is a long tradition on this has been collected a lot of information. There are internationally recognized, recognized uh, data banks that are available and accessible. And, um, and there are also models that have been developed in the last few years, like the reveals and log models. Reveals is for global scale, log is for more local scale, but putting the two together are able to create um, reconstruction at global with the possibility of zooming in into the local. Um, everything is worked on an eight by eight kilometer grid square all over the world. So the world is covered by this, by this grid and all the reconstruction are done at this level. And obviously the direct line of evidence is the past vegetation. The land use. It's based on archeological and historical data. So there is a shift in terms of what data we are going to use. And um, the assessment is done 
at different levels um, is done using multiple criteria, also using judgment expert, and um, it's iterative and transparent. What we would like to have is a structure that allow to have the data there for everybody to look at it and to understand how the conclusion has been made on that data. Um, it's polygon-based aggregation at the global scale data, and again, using the same grid as the pollen people. So that's, you know, for the final scope of putting together the modeling, then we need to have, you know, similar constraints and similar um, baseline. Um, the output will be land use maps and a land use database that will be available to historical scholar, archaeological historical scholar, and to anybody that fundamentally wants to use that. Um, I think I skipped. Okay. Um, as I was saying, at the moment there is an incorporation of the land use in the, in the uh, climate models, but we need to improve that. Um, we need to improve that because we still do not understand the relationship between the land use and the land cover, so we need to better understand those relationships, and to do that, we need to have an understanding of the land use first, because if we don't have that, we cannot do the next step. And uh, also, um, this relationship, the way this relationship has been assumed up to now, and I showed you in the, in the previous map, have led at the production of different models, radically different models. And the other thing is very often, this assumption has been done also by people that are not coming from the social sciences. So there, there is a problem in there. Because if I'm a modeler, and I stick my finger up in the air, I can do many things, but you know that I'm not sure that in that many things I can do are really reflecting human behavior. So, and that's where we are at the moment and what we want to do. So, what is the land use side of the land cover group going to do? Understanding and collecting the available data, this is already happening. Um, you will see the presentation from Nikki and many others uh, related to Europe today. Uh, there is the Amazon going on, the South Asia, there is Andy that is going to present some work on South Asia, and many other areas are undergoing. And um, then the other work that has been done on a higher level is the standardization of the land use framework producing a guidebook in which there are the definition of the land use, so we need to all agree on how to call things, okay? And uh, also, the next step that are in preparation and will be available soon are training courses and online material, so that people that want to use this are able to understand how to use it. And um, finally, uh, the production of uh, uh, the bycode, I mean the final production of this, would be a set of land use map that can be used in different ways by both the community of the modeler and the community of the archaeologist and historian. And then hopefully a dynamic data repository that will be open to people that want to use it. Um, the standardization process that I was saying before, one of the, of the work is to produce land use categories that uh, can be used to identify and classify the way people use land in the past all over the world. So um, this is just an, an extra of what is going on, but the level one categories, which are the highest level, are quite broad. And obviously, the more you go down, the more these categories start to be subdivided. Um, using something that you will see much better later on because it's one of the best maps produced up to now. So the Europe group has been doing a lot of work and, um, and so the idea is then to have, to produce maps that fundamentally uh, will gather together all this 
data that has been published and data that is also great data, data that is in the drawers of people, and uh, they uh, can be, you know, can be put into this. Um, what is the relevance for archaeology? Empirical record of human earth, discussion of data at different scale, heritage, first and traditional landscape, diversity of experience in life ways, and rich the understanding of material culture. So there are many reasons why I think uh, we should have this. And uh, why effectively archaeology, beyond the fact that we have an interest, why archaeology should be involved in this? Because we will be able to learn more uh, because there will be more collaboration outside the um, community of archaeology. But also, and most important for me, is also this. Other communities are already using archaeological data, often without really understanding or really using in the right way. And so I think we should be involved in that, and we should have a voice in that, and we should be there. Um, so that's the land cover 6K land use dynamics. And part of the presentation of today will show what has been going on on this. And I hope that the others are going to bring in new uh, data, new interest on this kind of a um, dynamics. Thank you.